thanks, I think, for the AWS team they have for all the presentations since this morning. They have been wonderful. And thanks, everyone, for attending. So I think uh, whatever we were talking about, I think one of the real big success factors for AWS is uh, the working backwards culture that we have at AWS. So that's one of the reasons you see so many of these services, which seems to be specifically built for your most of the use cases that we see, right? So we understand the customer's pain points, work with them, and then build services like 90 to 95% of our roadmap. So it's driven by customer requirements and only four to five percent of that is more strategic. So that kind of answers the question on uh, why do we have so many services and how how is it that we answer so many use cases so perfectly? So driving into that, uh, data analytics is another domain where uh, we really have a really good uh, strong foothold on what we do uh, and how we process the data. As Kunal was saying, getting data into S3 is just the first piece and then having all these capabilities with machine learning, AI, and we will talk a bit about uh, visualization, the data warehouse in the cloud and all of that. So that will give more insight into uh, how we process all of the data and how at AWS we look at data just not uh, as just data, but it is more like a strategic asset. So just to uh, point that out, so this uh, this thing from the econom Economist that was published a while back talks about uh, data being the most valuable thing rather than oil going forward because of the strategic decisions and competitive advantages and edges that you can get with this data, especially with machine learning, AI, ML, and processing all of the data. So as we, again, as we work backwards from the customers and when we started to ask them questions, so few things that we found out and customers wanted us to have handle on their behalf were the data was growing exponential, right? So I am pretty sure some of you have seen this graph where we say zettabytes of data will be generated in the next five, 10 years. And data is coming from multiple of these new sources, right? So you have social media, you have voice analytics, a good example, you have the major. So all this data that we have are, so until recently, no one really thought about processing images or no one really thought about processing voice or even a phone call or something like that. So we will talk about the use case, how we solved the uh, voice analytics for a customer. And increasingly like diverse set of uh, users, right? I mean, uh, the same set of transaction or same set of data is being visualized from a data scientist perspective totally differently versus someone who is looking at the same data from someone from marketing, right? So the same data is being analyzed by multiple applications, like uh, the same transaction set of data might be used by multiple machine learning models to look at it from different perspectives to figure out different, to kind of predict different values, right? So the same set of data that you are sitting in S3 is being used multiple times by multiple people for multiple reasons. So these, the customers were, uh, uh, working with us to kind of solve some of these challenges that were, they were facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And some of the typical types of uh, analytic users that we see out, if you look at it, are from the architects, the CXOs, the data engineers, the data scientists who want to be, that is what I think Krunal in his uh, machine learning slides were talking about, where you really want to build those TensorFlow models and stuff, you can do that. At the same time, you want to just use some of these models which are built in like the recognitions of the world, the comprehend and stuff like that as well. And the uh, VPs and all of that, all of these are, so if you look at the overall analytical user base, right, it, it is all the way from your data scientists who want the hardcore uh, TensorFlow models to someone is at a very high level uh, from a CXO point of view who just want to see what is going on in my overall business and how do I address that. So if you think about the breadth of how, how much uh, data or how much processing we need, that is where I think the AWS landscape will really help us with addressing each one of those individually to make sure each one gets their specific uh, customized uh, services. So some of the uh, first use cases as we talk to customers on moving into uh, data analytics on AWS are the biggest one we see are data warehouse modernization. So data warehouses are I mean, really good, but at the same time, when you do it on premises, there are a lot of challenges with them. They keep growing exponentially with the data increasing 
so you need to you need to keep adding it which again is very costly operation on premises so that was definitely one of the biggest thing that we normally when we talk to people on why they have, what are the biggest challenges with the data in their day to day world the other one is building data like as i talked about there are these unstructured data the images the audio files there are semi structured data semi structured is basically more like a excel kind of thing where you have some kind of structure but again when you look at the entire workbook it is not structured it could have complications like having vba scripts and stuff and real time streaming and analytics so traditionally a data warehouse would process the data during a batch process which runs at the end of the day so the reports are generated next morning so if you really think about the time between the data is generated at the transaction level and it is being consumed by the end user reports it's like a day or two delay in a traditional world right but today the customers want real time analytics right they want to make decisions so quickly and react so quickly to the usage patterns or the customer patterns and also basically you want a more of an operational and search analytics that is basically where you want to have and like rather than waiting for something to fail for example in an operations environment you want to be able to predict this is the one that might be having a problem and kind of solve that similarly search analytics is very similar to what amazon kindred does is look at your entire search patterns and try to come up with human readable solutions and finally you want to give the business users the data and make data more as a self service because one of the biggest things we saw as we went and talked to our customers on the business side of things was like was more like the business for any of the things they wanted to do had to go to it to get the work done and all of that but having a data driven or a self service kind of environment is where you provide all the data elements to the business and let them play around with how to handle different things or come up with some insights that they can so traditional data warehouse the biggest challenges were with silos uh, as we talked about and so that is one of the reasons people were moving into data lakes uh, as i talked about different formats uh, data warehousing machine learning big data analytics and all of that and few things with the data lake you want to have certain formats which are specific to the analytics so things like parquet orc avro those so these are file formats that are very specific for analytics pretty much driven by the columnar storage storage parquet and uh, orc or columnar storage so the idea there is you do a lot more analytics on columns rather than on the entire row whereas avro is more like row based so we can dive deep into that in case we want to please let us know we would love to and uh, talk about those and the other thing there you can see on the data lake side is the centralized catalog right so that has been a challenge for our data warehouses which evolved from a single operational data store into the data warehouses on premises is defining those terminologies right so for example if you go to a company which has multiple lines of business and talk about what different what the word margin means you might get multiple answers right so having those common catalog really helps us uh, build a really really amazing data lake and make sure everyone consumes the data lake very easily so a couple of things uh, with data lake again we are a data lake is just an extension of your data warehouse it is not like replacing your data warehouse so normally the architecture we see is you have your source systems put the data into your data lake and then data warehouse reads all the data from the data lakes as well so pretty much it is uh, we are not saying data warehouse does not have a space we think data where it is just an extension of your data warehouse and you can base pretty much store the data in any format durable security compliance is a very big thing at a for uh, as at aws it's always job zero and we want to when you think about it tie all of this together into that one single platform right so that is where we talk about have able to run your analytics not just from your data warehouse which typically is what we saw before was uh, you would have your reporting tools like quicksight or uh, any of our reporting tools out on the market trying to connect to a data warehouse and try to run standard sql or something like that we want to expand that bit even more with things like machine learning with things like analytics with things like uh, even processing files as well at the same time we want to be secure compliant to make sure uh, we follow all the necessary regulations and we want to protect our customers data as well 
So a few things uh, from a, uh, from uh, from an AWS standpoint, when we look at uh, when we look at cost, because that is one of the driving things, uh, as I said, on on-premises data warehouse or data environments, we want to make sure we are able to address that on the cloud. The way we do that is we have multiple types of instances. Uh, we have what we call on-demand, where you can pay for uh, hour you use. Reserved is where you give a commitment of a one or a three year, and you pay less amount. And then we have spot instances, which is like you get about seventy to eighty percent discount on the on-demand rate. The only pro only thing with spot instances is we can terminate the spot instances, but we give you about a two minute warning before we terminate. So if you have if you have uh, scenarios where uh, you can reproduce the workload. We would strongly recommend trying to do that in spot instances where you don't have any time commitments. And uh, we talked about earlier this morning where we have the network, uh, which, is, which is AWS maintained network within, within different regions at the same time, uh, even between uh, within the single availability zone, it is like 100 Gbps, so which is like extremely strong. And we also have certain provisions where you can have a placement group where the instances are very close to each other as well. And finally, we have about 200 plus instance types and choices that you can make. So it is not like we give you only limited set of instances that you want to play, play with. We have like 200 different instance types that you can select from. And we can even experiment with the amazing thing with AWS is you experiment with certain things, you don't like it, you can port to a higher higher instance type or even there if you if you feel it we are not at the we are over provision we can pretty much go down to a lower instance type as well and finally as as we see the data is coming in and data is growing we want to make sure we are we want to support the cost initiatives and we want to be cognizant of the cost that we add here so that is one of the reasons we have like five different tiers in our s3 so the idea there is s3 is your data lake where you start putting all, everything that you can all the way from your structured files that you get from the transactional systems to uh, the way the voice and uh, voice files that you get and every type of file that you can think of in there but we also support multiple tiers. So if you do, if you think there is uh, the data that was generated yesterday is very important versus data that has been generated a few years from now, you might not be using that. Then you can pretty much move that data into what we call Glacier. It is a low, it is a cold storage for us where the data is still as secure and as durable and as available as a as a standard S3. But it, but the idea is we would not be using that as much as S3. So you would pretty much go and store it. It's more like an archiving storage, so you can store there. And you can even automate, uh, automate all the movements of this data between these five different storage tiers, right? That way you don't have to have know which, uh, like you don't have to keep worrying or running scripts to make sure the data moves here and there. So the overall analytical portfolio for uh, AWS, if you look at it, uh, we talked about is that we categorize that into four different uh, layers here. The first one is data movement. How do you get the data into the data warehouse, into your data lake or the data warehouses? The next thing is what is the infrastructure that you want to use, whether it's uh, how, how are you going to provision your data lake in the first place? The next one is how do you run analytics out of this data that you have in the data lake? And finally, how do you visualize or engage and use uh, things like the machine learning and everything that we talked about and Kunal talked about earlier. So we will talk about all the four, uh, four layers here and uh, try to tell you how, how AWS helps with that. So coming into the data moment, so we, Basically, there are multiple ways we do support uh, how movement of data into AWS, into AWS S3, which is our primary primary data lake storage. And you also can uh, look at, as I said, Glacier is our cold storage, the archive storage. And we also support uh, things like direct connection into AWS, so you can have a direct connect. We also have snowball devices where we send the device into one of your uh, data centers. You can load the data, and we normally suggest it anything over about uh, 10 terabytes or something like that. We suggest snowball devices, and we can actually, there is a snowmobile, which is pretty huge, which goes up to 10 petabytes, where you can move the data into S3. And then we also have glue and the glue is a very tricky thing that I will talk about. Uh, and it's really interesting because uh, it is very, yeah, with glue, you can basically have certain set of files that uh, you let them sit in S3 and glue has a feature called catalog data catalog, where you can basically let glue the data catalog scan your files in S3 and give you the metadata. So that is really powerful, especially when you are not really sure about what kind of data you have uh, it in there. 
and real time uh, sources we talked about it kinesis is our, our real time offering so we have different uh, streams in kinesis you can do kinesis data stream to push the data into uh, aws and the amazing thing about it is uh, with kinesis uh, data stream and kinesis firehose you can pretty much write the data real time into aws redshift which is our uh, which is our database data warehouse in the cloud we will talk about it at a high level and all and also you can uh, kinesis also supports video streams uh, videos live video streams right so things like that as well we do support so if you think about the there are i believe about uh, 12 to 13 different ways in which you can get data into aws or real time into aws either through some of these mobile devices or uh, some of uh, some of the real time things that we were talking about so moving into the data lake infrastructure and uh, how do we uh, manage uh, so we basically covered this slide earlier when we talked about what were the challenges so a couple of things that we wanted s3 is our primary data warehouse a uh, data lake structure sorry for that uh, but we have 11 nines durability which means that uh, you would pretty much uh, not uh, like in every 10000 years in 10 million files you would lose a file so it's probably it's not going to be an issue and the the whole, how do we achieve this durability is anytime you give us a file it is replicated in three different places so uh, so it is pretty secure and you can even control who has access to those files at a file level right so that is that is pretty amazing on how you can do that and by default anything that you create is not public unless you explicitly tell us to make this public and you get a lot of warnings to make sure you understand what it is and again we don't want you to we don't want to force you to have three replications there are scenarios where you can tell us we don't need three replications i just need one replication right a good example for that people talk about and we see is uh, let's say you have a huge image that you took on your dslr you upload it to s3 and you generated a thumbnail you don't really need the thumbnail uh, always to be there on all the have three copies of the thumbnail right so scenarios like that we want to make sure we, we don't overcharge you for those so we want to uh, there is an option where you can just store it on one ac and again as i talked about there are multiple uh, uh, storage classes which you can use uh, for different use cases uh, based on how you use it so glue again is our uh, etl offering uh, so aws glue is a serverless uh, offering for air data transformations so basically what we do you can connect it to any source it could be s3 uh, it could be any jdbc odbc drivers that you have it could be rds stuff like that you could basically connect it to redshift again we will talk about that in a bit and you can read the data transform it and then you basically behind the scene what happens uh, a, the glue runs a spark job uh, and you can bake pretty much anything you can do in spark you can do in glue and transform the data and load it back either into s3 or wherever you need to based on the your need right but the important thing here is you don't have to provision any of the servers you don't have to maintain any of the servers and it is you only pay for the time you use it right so that is really amazing if you think about how you process etl right those scenarios like you have your day-to-day -day processing your batch or your day-to-day -day might not be really high but your month end or quarter end or year end might be extremely high right so you don't have to provision that infrastructure for your month end or year end always right you just provision it uh, you just tell us what to do and we will take care of the infrastructure behind the scenes and uh, you just pay for whatever you use and that is really powerful when you when you combine that with the catalog feature that look gives us so uh, some uh, basically make uh, say, uh, challenges uh, of uh, handling the data lake is basically setting up the storage moving the data as uh, i think Prunal talked about preparing the data is one of the biggest challenges for uh, even a data warehouse or any kind of machine learning and making sure you have the right compliance is right and security controls right so it is nice that we keep, we keep we say that okay you can get all of your data into s3 but now how now the question is how do you control access does the entire org have access to all of my data lake now that is where we come in with specific uh, specific bucket level control so we have something called bucket naming strategies where we suggest like how you want to name your buckets such a way that you can control access which department has access to what so that your sensitive data is not exposed to people who they are not supposed to right so there are there are ways you can control it at a file level as well so in a bucket if i have 100 files you can control it who has access to what 
and finally making data available through analytics to everyone right so we also talk about how do we anonymize the data right and we have services called macy which i don't have here right but uh, macy is an amazing service where you can point it to an s3 bucket and it keeps looking for uh, any pii data phi data specific sensitive information that might come into that bucket right so that is an amazing thing that automatically keeps scanning your s3 buckets and alerts you when something is not supposed to be there has come right so that is really important because you might not initially think my data lake would have any PI, PHI or PII, but eventually if you have Methi configured uh, to work the right way, eventually if someone accidentally puts a file, you get alerted and you can take action immediately. So we have another offering called the lake formation. Uh, lake formation rather than uh, is again a specific uh, service that we have. Uh, as I talked about data lake, maintaining a data lake is not straightforward as you saw. It has about seven to five, seven, five to seven steps based on how you see it. So we came up with an offering call. We understood that uh, the customers wanted something even simpler. So we came up with a service. It's called Lake Formation. It's a comprehensive, it's basically an integrated tool of all the steps that we just saw about into one single service. And it uses behind the scene glue, it uses machine learning transforms, and also it has a lot of access controls. It has its own access level control in case you want, you don't want to integrate with IAM, you can do that at uh, Lake Formation level. And all of this, uh, the machine learning sits on top of, uh, sorry, the data lake uh, formation sits on top of s3 bucket so you still have that uh, storage that you get with s3 on top of which you can have uh, the lake formation so we will next move into the analytical services how do we process all of this data so uh, emr is our uh, elastic map reduce which again is may uh, uh, is kind of managed so you just tell us what kind of service you need you can run spark hadoop the hive and the entire hadoop world that you have uh, on premises you can easily run that on emr without any any issues and pretty much you can select from the from the latest versions that you have again uh, one of the biggest thing i see uh, customers really use emr is to process the data and to do a lot of analytics on that data and only do that for the time they need, right? So they run those analytics during the nighttime and they want to do some specific pattern recognition or something like that, and then they shut it down. And specifically with uh, combining this with EC2 spot instances where you can uh, have the worker nodes actually be your spot instances because the entire Hadoop environment is built on everything phase and uh, thought. So any like, tying this with the EC2 spot, you would pretty much save about 50 to 80% on top of uh, whatever savings you get uh, out of the box for EMR. And because all the data is persisted in S3, it's pretty much anyone, like it's not just the EMR can access the data, there is no proprietary format or something. So all this data that we generate, you can save in Parquet formats, which means this Parquet files that you generate out of EMR are available for everyone to use uh, for further analytics as well. And all you do is like few clicks and you have these EMR clusters up and running. I believe it is three clicks. You can have an EMR cluster, a pretty good EMR cluster up and running and you will have a connection to it and you can pretty much set it up. It's that simple. So Redshift again is, as I have been talking about, is one of the uh, fastest uh, uh, growing services in AWS uh, we have. Uh, so it is our Redshift, uh, is our data warehousing offering in uh, AWS. So if you the behind the scene how it works is we took PostgreSQL, we then uh, broke it down and then we added massively parallel processing. We added analytical queries and all of those nice things. We even some of the hardware in the recent versions have uh, we there is a we had they have some hardware acceleration technology that we have. So there have been a lot of things that have been uh, invested in Redshift, right? In the last 18 months, I believe Redshift had about 200 plus new features that were released, which talked about how much investment we are doing in here. And basically what uh, uh, in this, uh, it basically integrates very well with your uh, data lake. It's very secure, very much like the IAM. It's extremely cost effective. One terabyte on, uh, on a Redshift is about $1,000 a year, which if you compare to anything uh, elsewhere is like uh, 10 times or even more than that, uh, lesser than what you do. So typically what we see users do, you have your input uh, clickstream data in this case, or any kind of data you put in S3, and then you can use a uh, copy command on S3 to just move the data into S3 and then start a, uh, so st the S3 then can load it into Redshift using copy command, and then you can have connectors into 
uh, Redshift to do a lot of reporting, right? It could be a simple dashboard in QuickSight or a very complicated dashboard in QuickSight. And to like for the COVID right now, for the COVID crisis that we are going through right now, we actually have set up a data lake. So if you can go to a, if you want to look at it there is a you can just search aws data aws covid data lake and there is a free data lake that we set up with all these types of multiple types of data that we have been getting we stored all of that in one place so the scientists and machine learning experts and doctors all of them can come to one place and have the look at this data and process that data as well so we have been working this has been really good there and uh, just to continue on the redshift a bit here it has strong integration with all the AWS integration. It ties very well with the RDSS and all of that. It is scalable. So uh, we have recently released what we call the RA3 instances. Uh, RA3 instances are the ones where you have the storage and compute are different. So previously, before uh, reInvent of 2019, what uh, you had to do is you had to select an instance type for that shift. But as we work backwards, we understood the customer's pain. When you bought an instance, you had certain amount of memory, certain amount of CPU, and that moved on. But as, as we started to understand that the customers are having more data and not computing everything they might not really need, they, we started to decouple both of these. So in our, in our newest RA3 instances, you basically pay for the compute uh, different and the storage different, and these are proprietary to Amazon. So that way you don't have to pay for huge instances just to store data, right? So that is a really, really huge thing when you really think about uh, data warehousing in the cloud and the way we are, the amount of data is growing in general. And we also have something called Aqua. This is again is a new thing we released in 2019 of reInvent and that is a cache layer that we built. So that uh, scenarios like where you have the same internal query, let's say you have this reporting platform and you have these internal queries which are being run all the time, Aqua is intelligent enough to kind of say, okay, I'm seeing this pattern. It uses machine learning as well behind the scene. It sees the kind of queries uh, that are being hit on it for a daily day-to-day -day basis. And then it says, okay, these are the, uh, this is a derived query I need to calculate beforehand. And then it calculates it and uh, stores the uh, values. Then the obvious next question is, what if my data changes? So it is aware of when the underlying data changes and it refreshes the caches and all of those nice things. And it is, uh, as with AWS, uh, most of us, uh, all of our services are always security compliant, security is our job here, and we want to keep that uh, extremely, uh, extremely good. And it also integrates with KMS, which is our key management service. So if you want to encrypt the data with that, it is more than welcome. So Kinesis, we talked about it. Video streams is our uh, Kinesis video streams is where you can stream your video data stream is built for applications where you want to send uh, real time data into uh, the AWS environment and uh, Kinesis uh, Firehose can directly con connect with uh, Redshift so any data that comes in directly can go to Redshift. And uh, Kinesis data analytics is again very popular. So even before you write the data into uh, Redshift or RDS or anywhere, you can actually run uh, SQL queries in Kinesis data analytics on some of these uh, shards. So what, what we call shard is a pipe that you create in Kinesis through which you send the data in. And in real time, you can start querying uh, querying this data in the shards in Kinesis even before it is written. And that, if you really think about it, it's a really amazing thing, right? So scenarios I, I normally see is uh, when you are inserting certain data and you want to make sure there are there is no abnormality in the data you can pretty much keep running the data uh, running the data analytics and if you see any abnormality you can immediately send a notification and think about it the data gener is generated and you wrote something into kinesis data stream and now the analytics these all of this happens within few milliseconds right so if you have a data and you got an alert in less than few seconds now you have an opportunity to act on that rather than to be it is more like a react it's more like a proactive stuff rather than being reactive for the data to be written into your warehouse and have certain processes run and then analyze it so these are the kinds of things that we have been thinking about and doing so the elastic search is again a very powerful thing uh, uh, it's uh, it's basically open source kibana kind of thing where it is uh, it's fully managed. Again, you pay for what you use. It's scalable. And uh, I think the biggest one right now, there are uh, support, you, we support more than 64 terabytes of Elasticsearch wherever you need. So it is uh, basically in case you want to do some uh, search at scale, 
and uh, you don't want to manage any of these uh, servers and stuff like that. We see a lot of uh, dashboards like the Kibana lock stacks kind of stuff uh, having using this and uh, the other other thing uh, you you see a lot of uh, scenarios where you want to you don't want people to really have manage any of these infrastructures right so all of these services that we have been talking about are managed services which means you really don't have to worry about the hardware provisioning or maintenance or all of those nice things we we take care of that for even red shifts and uh, everything you tell us uh, for red shift for example you tell us what is the maintenance mean when we take care of that and uh, again uh, Elasticsearch is built on an open distro, so it's a, a something like the it's a open license that we have, so you can pretty much run SQL and all of those normal uh, stuff that you normally use, and it is hundred percent open source and enterprise grade. So, so it is all driven by the community as well uh, there. So if you if you need anything, you can uh, look into some of those challenges there. So, Athena is other, uh, again a really powerful uh, powerful thing for us. So here is uh, Athena, you can, uh, the biggest thing is uh, you can basically write a SQL on a uh, file that is stored in S3, right? So think about if you're moving millions of these files into S3, it could be IoT devices, which are sending millions of files, or it could be a uh, batch process structured data, or it could be JSON kind of stuff that you're moving into S3, rather than loading that into a table and that, then writing a SQL to analyze it, Athena gives you the flexibility of writing queries on files that are stored in S3 very instantly. And that is really powerful, right? So you pay based on how much GB you scanned, right? So if you uh, if you scan like 5 GB of data to get results for that single query, you pay for the data that you scanned there. And it is SQL compliant. So you, all you do is write us a very simple SQL and you, uh, it basically looks at the data catalog, then goes and right, uh, looks at the data or the files that it needs to, and then result, it gives back the results. And again, nothing to manage here. It's all taken care uh, by AWS. It's a managed service as well. And it really integrates well with QuickSight. QuickSight is our visualization tool, which we will talk about in a minute here. And uh, yeah, I think the other thing I forgot to tell about uh, of, uh, Athena is, if you have compressed files, right? So the other question I normally get is, what if I have a gzip files or something, some kind of compression, what happens? If you have a zip files, uh, Athena supports zip files, so it will do the uncompression and it will make sure it scans the right data. So you don't have to pay for the unzipped version of it, you just pay for whatever is a zipped version of it. So when you think about all of this that we have been talking about till now, right? Uh, eventually you can run the entire analytics pipeline that we have been talking about till now using pretty much no server with what we call the serverless analytics so you can pretty much run everything without maintaining a single server and all of that is taken care of by aws and you only pay for the resources that you use so if you have a high intensive thing that you want to run at a given point you just pay for that uh, high intensive workload or high intensive uh, processing that you need and then you don't have that infrastructure you don't pay for that anymore so things like a good example in this case i think this lays well with our uh, earlier two sessions was you have these iot data you put all of that into a uh, data lake then you have glue processing the data and building the data catalog then you have athena to query that and then you have AIML that ties into Athena very well. And finally, you have reporting in QuickSight, right? So if you look at it, everything is uh, scalable. Everything is highly available. Everything here is, uh, none, none of the things here is you have, um, you, you don't have to maintain anything. It's all managed services from AWS and uh, it is fault tolerant as well. And uh, th th that is, I think that is what we call the serverless analytics pipeline here. And finally, we talk about data visualization and machine learning. I'll skip through, I know we are running close to the time here, so I'll try to skip through quickly. So data exchange is our newest platform that we released again in November uh, at reInvent. It is basically a place where if you have a huge set of data, you can pay someone to get uh, insights into that data or you can have, uh, it's basically a data exchange environment where you can uh, either buy data from someone else or even uh, license the data from someone else and easily integrate with the third party tools that we have. QuickSight is our uh, 
is our visualization platform. It's very powerful. We have a COVID-19 uh, dashboards built around. You can just check for COVID-19 quick side dashboard. You should have access to that. It is basically some of the elastic scaling. Again, there are no servers that you maintain. It integrates very well with all the AWS services I talked about, Athena, Redshift, RDS, and all of those nice things. It has security integrated as well, and it also has programmatic support, which which is very rare with uh, some of the reporting tools that you normally see on premises is uh, that you don't have that API access, but with uh, QuickSight, I think that uh, that is a big thing, especially when you have things on apps and stuff where you want to share these dashboards. Right. And finally, I think we talked about the predictive analytics, so that was a good leeway into this session. So uh, we can do a lot of predictive analytics on this, all the data that you have in S3, you can train multiple models on SageMaker and or you can use our AI services like Comprehend Recognition and even uh, some of those to do uh, auto ML again is a wonderful thing. <coughs> where all you have to tell it is what are the things I'm trying to predict and uh, you should be able to get some uh, some really good analytics out of there. So from a next steps perspective, what can you do? I know we talked about uh, uh, how to get credits and stuff. So if you don't have already an AWS account, the first thing I would strongly recommend you is go create an AWS account and we have what we call 10 minute tutorials we know. We know we don't have one those huge tutorials. So you have 10 minute tutorials for all of our services just to talk about what the service is, what it does, and start building projects. So the first year you have um, some of our services are free for the first year and you can play around with them and uh, we can help you with some of the credits as well. So a lot of analytical stuff that we have been building here. Uh, and um, as you can see, most of these analytical stuff are catered to specific set of users. And uh, at the same time, we want to cover all, all of these uh, broad, broad based users. And also what we have uh, what we call the breadth and depth in our technologies. So if you look at this analytical space, the depth of the technologies we have are extremely high, right? So that is the reason we do that is we want to make what we call purpose built services. So we don't want to force if certain things does not fit into a service, we don't want you, our customers to use those services. We will build new services for them and have, help them with uh, getting these analytics out of their data. I think that's it. So I'll take any questions.